So at the end of the last session, we looked at covenants, and we, we identified what a covenant was, and we identified how it functions. And if you recall, uh, the definition that I came up with was that a covenant, particularly God's covenants, are a reinforcement or an amplification, if you wish, of plain speech, because it has to be clear, about an essential issue. That's what a covenant is for. And a covenant does certain things. It confirms things, and it ends disputes. It can't end a dispute if it doesn't mean what it says, and both parties don't know what it says. Do you see? Or they're interpreting it differently. That's why using the words in the oath, it's, uh, it's not something you just slap to de together um, off the cuff. You think out what you are going to say in that covenant. Now, we've looked at the Noahic covenant, the first covenant, and you've all agreed with me that God meant what he said in that covenant. We looked at the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, it uh, promises the land to Abraham and his descendants, and we know that the descendants from chapter 15 are his physical offspring. And chapter 17 reinforces that by saying it's through Isaac that your seed will be uh, counted, and on through Jacob and the 12 tribes. So they get the land. And then also, all the families of the earth are blessed through Abraham. There is, you know, prosperity and other things that are involved in that. They'll make you a great name and, and so on. And the great name in that context is probably not just Abraham himself, but also Israel, which is really yet to, to come about. So we haven't looked, though, at the way that these covenants are going to be fulfilled and what we're doing in these lectures is we're trying to figure out how Christ is central, how Christ brings all of this stuff together. And in order to explore that, we need to look at Jesus Christ's relationship to the other covenant that we haven't mentioned yet, the new covenant, okay? So let's take a gander at this. We'll remind ourselves that the Mosaic Covenant creates an impasse. So it doesn't matter what God promised in those oaths. He cannot fulfill them upon wicked and disobedient people. The Mosaic Covenant shows us that we are sinners. So we might ask, does this mean that God is off the hook? He can make any promises he wants, can't he? Knowing that we'll mess up and he doesn't have to fulfill them. He doesn't have to deliver because he knows he can count on the fact that human beings are going to mess it up. Is that how we're to interpret those covenants? Of course not. Remember that God knows about everything that's going to happen. He, this is a creation project that we're involved in here. So, we might ask another question. Do God's words and his actions actually coincide? I mean, I've tried to make the, the uh, case for that, but is that really true? If it is true, then clearly God has got to get past that impasse that is created by the law and by our sin. How does he do it? Again, just in review... We find that the other covenants can't get past the requirements of the law. Therefore, they do not have the means of their fulfillment within themselves. Have you ever noticed that? Even though they have fantastic promises, you know, David, you're going to have a kingdom and, you know, you're going to reign or your descendants are going to reign and so on. All of these wonderful promises don't have the means of their own fulfillment built into them they are going to, if they're going to have to come true, they're going to have to rely on something else.
God's creation project is not frustrated. He doesn't change tracks. He doesn't turn left when we expected him to turn right. He will do exactly what we expect him to do, providing our expectation comes from the plain sense of Scripture, and it's not an expectation that we've created in our own minds by the use of independent reasoning. So let's examine then these same covenants, but we'll move into the prophets now. Now, by the way, the material that I'm giving you is very edited and slimmed down. Some of uh, my students there know that. Okay, this takes a long time. There are three courses that I teach on this material. I teach about uh, the, uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah. I teach about the covenants in uh, the rest of the Old Testament, particularly the, pro uh, the prophets. That's another course. And then in the New Testament, that's another course. There are three courses that you're getting boiled down here. So if I don't go through all of the details, it's because of that reason. All right. Now let's start with this. This is Isaiah 45, <coughs> verses 15 through 18. And uh, it says this, Truly, you are God, who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, there's creation, who is God who formed the earth and who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. There's a purpose, okay? There is a teleology and an eschatology that are running together, a purpose that's driving towards a consummation. We saw that yesterday. So that basically, again, is a reminder that there is a creation project that's ongoing. All right. Let's have a look at a few verses here. Hosea chapter 1 and verse 10 says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. That's a quotation, isn't it? From Genesis. But Hosea, who's an 8th century prophet, is quoting it. He doesn't change it. He doesn't say it's a type. He doesn't spiritualize it. He doesn't allegorize it. He doesn't do anything to it. He just quotes it. Amos, another 8th century prophet. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. I will plant them in their land... And no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them. That was not fulfilled in 1948. Okay? It was not. But it will be. <clears throat> and then here's Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32, verse 41. I will rejoice over my people to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart, and with all my soul. Okay, Jeremiah, he's an exilic prophet. So he's back in the 6th century. Still no change. The land, by the way, doesn't mean the whole earth. The land means the land that God deeded to Abraham in Genesis 15. It means the land of Canaan. We are told by many modern scholars that the land isn't important to God, the land of Israel. Not according to these prophets, you see. This is the Abrahamic covenant. These are examples of the Abrahamic covenant in the prophets. Abraham is circa 2000 BC. Here we're in the 8th century or the 6th century, we're 1,200 to 1,400 years removed from the time of Abraham, and nothing's changed. It's covenanted in, which means it's cemented in. You can't change them. It's just the way it is. So there's the Abrahamic covenant. 
not all of the aspects, we'd have to be here longer in order to explore that. Here's another text from Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. Anyone doing that now? No. Did anyone do it in Jesus' time? No, not an awful lot. I mean, Jews did, you know, once a year around the Pentecost uh, feast and so on. Then uh, Jerusalem had about, grew from about 80,000 to 250,000 in population. But that was only a short time, and that wasn't everybody. And that certainly they weren't saying to themselves, we will, you know, he will teach us his ways, and we should walk in his paths. This wasn't fulfilled. Now, a few things that I should point out to you here. First of all, it talks about the Lord's house, doesn't it? What is the Lord's house in the Old Testament? The it's the temple. That's right, Arlene, yes. And they wanted to go up to the temple. It's the house of the God of Jacob. Because Jacob, of course, that's a... What was he renamed? <coughs> Israel. When you see Jacob in the Bible, it means Israel, the nation, unless it's the guy. <clears throat> he, God, will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. That hasn't been fulfilled yet. Um, perhaps this is speculation. If it is, throw it away. But if this is a kingdom era prophecy, which if I really believe it is, if you read on, then perhaps it is the case that there will be an unmediated teaching from the Lord himself. You see? And we shall walk in his paths. We have to deal with the sin issue, but once the sin issue has been dealt with, there's nothing that would stop that necessarily, would there? Call that speculation if you like. Let's look at Zechariah, 6th century prophet. Behold, the man whose name is the branch... From his place he will branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. Well, I, you know, I heard you the first time. Why did he repeat it? Because it's important. Pay attention to it. He, the branch, will build the temple of the Lord. He didn't build Herod's temple. That was Zerubbabel's temple that Herod, not a nice guy, enlarged and got knocked down by the Romans. This guy is going to build the temple. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to construct it with his own hands, but he is going to oversee the building of it. Now look at this. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So shall he be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. What this guy's going to do is that he's going to reconcile the officer of the high priest and the king. He's going to bring them together. Okay? That hasn't happened yet, has it? And it never happened in Zechariah's time or any time after Zechariah. So what are we going to do with this? We can, if we want to cram this into the first coming of Christ, we're going to have to do what? We're going to have to change and transform the meaning. We can use all kinds of euphemisms. We can say it's transformed, it's improved, it's expanded. Or we can tell the truth and just say that, uh, no, you just simply changed it. You altered it. It doesn't mean what it says. Here's Zechariah again, chapter 14. It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations that uh, went up against Jerusalem in the last days shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, in the house of the Lord of hosts. You don't worship kings. 
you might do them obeisance, but you don't worship kings unless the king is God. This hasn't happened yet. I believe it will because God means what he says. One more in Malachi. This is the last of the prophets writing approximately 500 years before Christ. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, and that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Well, the priests in Jesus' time didn't offer any offering in righteousness, did they? I mean, they were a completely unrighteous bunch. Notice the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord. That's the temple. This is the priesthood. There was a covenant made with Phineas and his descendants. It's an everlasting covenant. Now, the word everlasting, olam, it can mean until the end of the age. Until the end of, say, the, the kingdom age, the millennium. It could mean everlasting. Whichever one that is, I'll let God decide, but he's got to come through on this promise. All right. Let's have a look at another one then. <clears throat> the prophets aren't changing anything, are they? You know, they're just taking it for granted that the covenants back in the book of Genesis and meant what they said. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and righteousness in heaven. No, in the earth. And in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast, I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. That's in Micah. Daniel. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. One like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. When the high priest asked Jesus, are you the Christ? He says, yes, I am. Well, you said it was so. And henceforth, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And so what did the high priest do? You've heard his blasphemy. They understood what Jesus was claiming. He was claiming to be this one who will be the rightful heir of David, the ruler, the Messiah. Son of Man is not just a, it's not a, a servant's title, it's a title of deity. This is the Davidic covenant. All right, moving on. A longer text in Isaiah chapter 11, but it is a wonderful text. I've uh, cha uh, not changed it, I've uh, kind of clipped a little bit here. I would have liked to have quoted from verse 1, but couldn't get it on the slide. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins. Faithfulness, the belt about his waist. Uh, this is the, you know, the, if you do karate and so on, this is the key, this is the strong area. So the, the belt around the waist, this is, uh, you know, his strength will be in these areas. Faithfulness, righteousness. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion shall, and the fatling together, and the little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. 
they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth, not heaven, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's a creation project. This world is not given up on. Yesterday, what did I try to tell you? That this world was created through Christ and for Christ. He cares about it. He is not going to let it go to, to waste. He is not going to allow the devil to ruin it or us to ruin it. So this will happen. In that day, I will also make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, the wall from the land. I will make them lie down safely. In Hosea, that's an 8th century prophet like Isaiah is. This deals with the creatures. This deals with the earth. This is kind of locked into the Noahic covenant, you see? You see, when Jesus comes back, he is going to rejuvenate the earth. He's going to rejuvenate the people of the earth, the animals of the earth. He's not going to come back where animals are killing other animals, and there's blood everywhere. He's, he's going to bring peace as the prince of peace. People will lie down safely. Even lambs will lie down safely next to wolves. So I can't imagine that. I can't imagine it either, but I believe it. Okay, now we're going to have to turn in our Bibles to two very important texts. First is in Jeremiah 33. Anyone knows of anything about my teaching knows that I love to go to this passage in Jeremiah 33. All right, verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing that I have promised to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He, so it's a person, shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. We've just read this. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called the Lord our righteousness. Couldn't call Jerusalem that right now, could you? Now look at what God says. This is an extraordinary passage. But thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Hold on a minute, just a minute, Jeremiah. You're going into exile. I mean, you're the one who is telling the last king to give it up. Judgment's coming. What does this mean? Well, it means that there's hope. In the same way as the previous chapter, Jeremiah uh, buys a piece of land. What on earth? Why would you buy a piece of land with the Babylonians outside the gates? You can't inherit it, can you? You can't take possession of it. But he, he takes it, he buys it at, in trust as a picture, as it were, an illustration of the fact that this is God's land. It doesn't matter if the Babylonians are overrunning it or the Romans are overrunning it or whoever else, the British are overrunning it. This is God's land. There is hope. God will deliver on his promises. So continuing here, verse 18, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually. Because at this time, the temple is under threat and uh, it's going to get destroyed. Solomon's temple. So this is an important word of hope. God knows that he's made these covenants. He reminds the people of these covenants so they can have faith in him. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, 
so that there will not be day and night in their season. That's the Noahic covenant. Okay? Genesis 8.22 and uh, chapter 9 and so on. Then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Then he gives another illustration of his steadfastness and his faithfulness. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. What covenant's that alluding to? Abrahamic. Very good, very good. So will I multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not considered what these people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord has chosen, he has also cast them off. Thus they have despised my people, as if they should no more be a nation before them. I am afraid that some Christians do that. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant is not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, back in Genesis 1, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, so that he will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captives to return and will have mercy on them. What you have in this passage is you have the most detailed, you have the most solemn, you have the most frank uh, confession or promise by God that he's going to stick by his covenants. You don't have anything like this in the New Testament at all. You have something similar in Jeremiah 31, but this is even more clear There is nothing like this. And God is saying, if you can make me break my covenants with the day and the night or the ordinances that I've set up as the creator, if you can do that, that's when you will see that these covenants don't mean what they say. Now, notice something in this passage. You can see by my heading here that the covenants are mixed together, aren't they? I mean, you've got the Davidic covenant, you've got the Levitical covenant, you've got the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Did I say the priestly covenant? Well, I just did now. (laughs) You've got, you know, you've got allusions to these covenants and they're going to be fulfilled, but not now. They're going to be fulfilled when the branch of righteousness will execute judgment and justice in the earth, which I believe, from a a remarkable deduction, is the second coming of Christ to set up his kingdom. Right, let's have a look at another one, Ezekiel. That's the next book over. Well, no, the second next book over, Lamentations, comes between them. Ezekiel 37. Now, most of you are aware of the dry bones illustration from Ezekiel 37, but I'm not going there. I'm going to the next part of it. And uh, from verse 21. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Which covenant's that? Abrahamic. Two points over there. (laughs) And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountain of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. Which covenant's that? Davidic. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. 
Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. That's a covenant terminology there. Whenever you see that, they shall be my people, I will be their God. You're talking about covenants there. David, my servant, shall be king over them. Davidic covenant. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. What's that? That's the priestly. Do you see? My tabernacle, priestly, also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God. They shall be my people. The nations, it's not talking about all peoples. It's talking about Israel here. And there are nations also. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel, set them apart to myself when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. This is the book of Ezekiel, and you only have to turn a few more pages, and lo and behold, guess what you come up against? A great big whopping temple. Just flip over there, because I want to point a few things out to you, just in case you're um, tempted to spiritualize this away, like many people, many Christians are. <clears throat> Chapter 40 and verse 4. The man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you. Fix your mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show you, them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. What's he got to do? He's got to pay attention. He's got to listen. He's got to look. Because he's got to take these details in. Because he is going to tell them to the people of Israel. Any problem there? Okay, next verse. It's called a temple. Chapter 43. Verse 1, afterward he brought me to the gate, I'm in Ezekiel 43, afterward he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east, and behold the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. Well, for that, you're going to have to get back to the earlier part of Ezekiel where he is making a model of the city and he's destroying it because he's picturing what's going to happen to the city. The literal city. And the literal temple in the earlier part of the book. And you know from, if you know your Bibles well, chapters 11 and, uh, 10 and 11 sorry, of Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord departs. Which gate does he depart from? The east gate. So you have in the first part of Ezekiel a temple, which is a real temple, which what I mean is it's a bricks and mortar temple. And it gets destroyed. And the glory of the Lord departs from the east gate. At the end of the book, you have the glory of the Lord coming in through the east gate of this temple. And we read, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision that I saw. 
And then verse 4, the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Any problem? You might have a problem believing it, but there's no problem with the words, is there? You may, might think, well, hold on a minute. I know when the dimensions are given of this place, it is far too big to go in present-day Jerusalem. You're right. So, you can, you're faced with a choice. You can either believe God or you can use your independent human reason to spiritualize it or typologize it or do anything else, eyes it, and then you can believe that and pretend that's what God said. Your choice. But before you do, read this. Go down to verse 10. Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangement, its exits, its entrances, its entire design, and all its ordinances, all its forms, all its laws. Write it down in their sight so that they may keep its whole design and all its ordinances and perform them. This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountain top is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. Verse 19, go there quickly. Same chapter, you shall give a bull, a young bull for a sin offering to the priests, the Levites, who are of the seed of Zadok, who is in the line of Phineas. It does fit together, guys but you have to believe what God says, okay? So I do believe that God says, and I, even though I can't figure it out, although I've given a hint in the book of Ze uh, Zechariah, even though I can't figure it out completely, I believe that there will be this whacking great temple in Jerusalem one day. And in Zechariah chapter 6, remember the, uh, the king who unites, he sits on his throne as a priest, do you remember that? He unites both offices, and it says, he will build the temple. Yes, he will build the temple. So we can leave it up to him. All right? And uh, you can call me a fool for believing this, but that's fine. I'm just going to believe God anyway, because if I was going to spiritualize this, I might as well start spiritualizing everywhere else. And when I start spiritualizing it, God no longer means what he says. And therefore, how do I know that my spiritualization or my typology is the correct spiritualization or typology? And therefore, how can I have any faith in it? And therefore, how can I please God? So I hope that you see that this is important stuff. All right, moving on. Go back to Jeremiah, but this time go to the next chapter after 33, which, surprise, surprise, is chapter 34. And uh, let's read something very important. This is what God thinks about people that break their oaths or change them. I'm going to read you some of the passage, okay? I'll put the main bit up there for you, but let me read from verse 8. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. After King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them, that every man should set free his male and female slave, a Hebrew man or woman, that no one should keep a Jewish brother in bondage. Now, when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should set free his male and female slaves, that no one should keep them in bondage anymore, they obeyed and let them go. But afterward, they changed their minds and made the male and female slaves return, whom they had set free, and brought them into subjection as male and female slaves. They spiritualized the covenant, didn't they? Oh, I don't really mean that. Didn't really mean what I 
said back there. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Which covenant's that? The Mosaic covenant, yes? At the end of the seven years, let every man set free his Hebrew brother. This is part of the Mosaic covenant, who has been sold to him. And when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. But your fathers did not obey me, nor incline their ear. Notice, please, incline your ear means to actually listen to the words and do them, yes? Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight, every man proclaiming liberty to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Then you turned around and profaned my name. And every one of you brought back his male and female slaves whom you had set at liberty at their pleasure and brought them back into subjection to be your male and female slaves. The, it doesn't say that they were going around blaspheming God, using God's name in vain, using it as a scatological term. It just said they went back on the covenant that they made before God, and that profaned God's name. To go back on a covenant is to profane God's name, which is to profane God's character, to impugn it. You cannot change covenants. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty, everyone to his brother and everyone his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, sarcasm, says the Lord, to the sword, to pestilence, to famine, and I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, please pay attention to the verse that's on the text, on the uh, overhead there. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, which was the original one that they followed, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it. What does that remind you of? That's what God did, isn't it? Back in Genesis 15. He had Abraham cut the animals in two, but he, God, passed through those parts, taking the solemn oath. These men did the same thing. Now God's going after them because they didn't perform the words of the oath. But according to these guys and many other people, those words can be transformed. Can they? No, they cannot. God takes it seriously when you mess with covenants, particularly the ones he's made. He will come after you for it. That's a very important verse, by the way. It is nearly always skipped over, but it's a very important verse. God expects you to perform the words of your covenant. So, by the way, if you make a covenant in your marriage, God will hold you to it. I know it's difficult, yes, and I know you ask, have to ask for forgiveness, but you need to, con to hold those words that you made to each other, you need to hold them as important to perform them. But what about this? I mean, all of this wonderful stuff that we've looked at, okay, we looked at the Abrahamic covenant and we looked at the priestly covenant and we looked at the Davidic covenant and all these fantastic kingdom promises and land promises and promises of peace and the animals are not even going to be after each other. It's going to be great. But there's a Mosaic covenant. It's in the way. It spoils it all, doesn't it? Because it says, thou shalt not. And we do. We shout. So it's a problem because it stops the fulfillment. So again, we have an option. We can say, oh, well, 
these can't be fulfilled, or we can actually just believe that God has a way past this. But the Mosaic Covenant does block fulfillment. All right, any questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, it's a long question, but it's basically uh, we can take that passage in Jeremiah and we can make an illustration of it and an application to our own lives. And uh, in that sense, when we fail to live up to what we ought to be as Christians, we're, you know, impugning God's name in that sense. Um, I would be very hesitant to do that. Uh, the reason is, is that it's a very quick step and short step from doing that to saying this is actually what it's teaching. Do you see? Which is what you'll find many preachers, they'll go to the Old Testament and they'll, without telling you the context and without telling you the, what it's actually saying, they'll straight away apply it to the church or to Christians. We need to be careful of that, but as far as if we understand that and we've explained it and then we say, oh yeah, but there is a truth, there's a principle in here, then uh, I think your observation holds, but we have to be careful. <clears throat> Yes, that's true. Uh -huh. That's true, but I wouldn't go to that passage to prove that. I'd go to, uh, you know, Galatians 5 or, um, you know, Ephesians 4 or Romans 12, somewhere like that, to prove that. There are better passages to do that with. Yeah. Another question? No. That either means that you're um, getting tired or it means that I've explained myself quite well. So what time are we? We are actually right on lunchtime, which is a complete and utter fluke from me because I'm normally never on time. So that being said, then, uh, Les, can you pray for us and pray for lunch? <clears throat>